Hi, today's movie is It's a Wonderful Life, the 1946 Christmas fantasy drama directed by Frank Capra. Now, I've got to come clean here and admit that I had never seen this movie before. In fact, I had avoided watching it. If you'd like to know why and hear my thoughts about the movie, I will tell you in just a second. It's a Wonderful Life stars James Stewart, Donna Reed, Lionel Barrymore and Henry Travers. On Christmas Eve 1945, 38-year-old George Bailey contemplates suicide. As his family and friends pray for George, angels in heaven decide to intervene and they brief trainee angel Clarence by showing him events from George's life from boyhood to the present moment. George's life seems to be one of continually thwarted plans and ambitions. With fate just getting in the way of his dreams of international travel and adventure. He is forced to succeed his father in running his hometown's building and loan company until on the Christmas Eve in question, his career, his life and his reputation are all threatened when evil businessman Mr. Potter frames him for misappropriation of funds and sends the police after him. George believes that his life is ruined, but can Angel Clarence convince him that his life matters enough to go on living? Now, as an inveterate lifelong film buff, it embarrasses me to say that I had never watched this movie before. And as I said in the intro, I had actively avoided watching it. And I think this is because I had developed this misconception that this film was some kind of uh, schmaltzy Christmas story. I am happy to say that I was so completely wrong in my uh, preconceived ideas about this movie. Far from being some schmaltzy Christmas film, I found It's a Wonderful Life to be a film about grief, trauma, existential pain and catharsis. This is a dark movie about raw and painful emotions and it seems to me it's a movie very much of its moment, and that moment being the end of World War II. Right from the start, this film seems steeped in grief, trauma, and the darkest of themes. George's suicidal despair, the spectre of accidental death and disability, George's brother's near drowning, and George's accidental deafness from saving him. Death by disease, misfortune, adversity and the continual thwarting of a person's hopes and dreams for their own life. The question of whether life itself is worth living. Now I think it would be very easy to see all of this as a reflection of the immense and shared psychic and physical trauma of World War II, which would have been still absolutely raw at this point in time. I had actually read uh, recently, just before I watched this film, that James Stewart had returned from his war service with severe PTSD and that this was the first film he had made after his return. Stewart was still decompressing from his war experiences during the making of this film and I would suggest that the very raw emotion he displays really reflect the shared trauma of his generation. George reaches a point in the story where all the grief and trauma and hardship simply become too much to bear and it breaks him and I would imagine that at this point in time many people of that generation would have felt exactly the same way. This is a film about how forces beyond one's control, historical forces like the Wall Street crash or the war or forces like death or disease can derail our hopes and dreams of what our lives will be like. Now I suspect that theme would have been particularly relatable and poignant to people who had just survived a world war and who had lost other people who had not survived it. The grief in the film is not just the grief of bereavement, it is the grief for all those lost dreams, the opportunities which are denied to us, and the ideas about ourselves which we are forced to give up. George wants so much for himself, travel, education, adventure, but he is forced to stay exactly where he is forced to stay at home and settle for a life he did not choose. Circumstances that are beyond his control and his own good nature, his desire to help people and to put others first, conspire to keep him where he is, even though it's not what he wants. 
time and time again, we see fate deal these heavy blows against George and what he wants for himself and what he wants for his life. But it's not just George who suffers these blows. The early flashback scene set in 1919, in which the druggist's son has died from influenza, uh, is another very telling moment in this film. I felt this was a reference to the 1918-19 influenza pandemic, which must also have pushed the audience's buttons as far as another terrible collective trauma that many of the people watching this film on original release would have lived through. It's a Wonderful Life feels almost like a piece of art therapy. It takes this trauma and grief and acknowledges the pain of them and the questions that they raise. Is life worth living if there is so much pain and adversity? Where do we find meaning amidst all this suffering? Who are we if our dreams are so frequently dashed? And in the end, the film does provide a great catharsis. It gives both to its main character and its audience a huge emotional release. I think it would be really hard to watch this film without crying. And I think a lot of the point of the film is inviting us, the viewer, to join in in that release. It's a film that is able to make us cry both tears of sadness and tears of joy. And I felt that its genius is in being able to turn one into the other. In more contemporary terms, it's a film that also asks us to consider the importance of gratitude. It's also a film that asks us to reframe our idea of our own worth. If it's not in the identity we dream of forging for ourselves, in the ambitions that we will likely never achieve, where is our worth to be found? And the film's very charming and persuasive suggestion is that it lies instead in the everyday influence we have, both small and large, on the people around us. The film suggests that the people around you would be poorer if you weren't here, that the world would be poorer if you didn't exist, and that while you might not achieve greatness, you don't have to achieve greatness to matter. It's a Wonderful Life is essentially a reverse Christmas carol, in that it's about a humble man who is good but has no idea about how good he really is. I found it interesting that the film's villain is an, is an immoral rich businessman whose only value is money. In society's terms, he is a success, but in the film's terms, he is a malignant and destructive presence with no personal integrity or values. In imagining the town without George, where Potter's capitalist impulses have gone left unchecked, the film suggests that a community led by a man like Potter loses its own values too and degenerates into a vulgar and ugly place, devoid of warmth. This is a pretty radical suggestion for a Hollywood film of this period, and it does make us think about contemporary leaders and the kind of, the kind of tone they set for their own communities. For a Christmas movie with angels in it, It's a Wonderful Life is a weirdly secular feeling film. It doesn't feel religious and it is much less about God than it is about a man's relationships to the people in his own community. This is where his salvation comes from and this is where he rediscovers his sense of worth and meaning. The cast of It's a Wonderful Life are uniformly wonderful, um, but of course the person who must be singled out is James Stewart who gives a really amazing and as I've mentioned before a very emotionally raw performance but for all the films uh, heavy and dark themes there is also a lot of warmth in the film and a lot of charm and one of the things I loved most in this movie was that um, George's uncle in the bank has a pet crow and no one ever mentions this he's just there and he's in so many scenes where he's not even acknowledged but he's a wonderful presence in the movie and of course, when I looked up the movie, um, what I was fascinated to discover was that the crow was played by Jimmy the Raven, who has over a thousand screen credits to his name and has appeared in such movies as The Wizard of Oz. I'm urging you to go to Wikipedia and look up Jimmy the Raven because it's absolutely worth it. James Stewart's uncle in the movie also has a pet squirrel who comforts him when he's sad. And this is one of the most tear-jerking moments of the film. It really got to me. I want a movie about his uncle and all his animal friends because the movie never really addresses it and I just want to know more about them. If you are looking for a film that acknowledges the trauma we all share, the pains we all share, the grief that wounds us all, 
This film touches all those psychic wounds that we share and then provides a powerful release. It will make you cry, but sometimes it's good to cry. Let's face it, 2020 has been horrible, and I think that's another reason to watch this film as we come to the close of this awful year. This is also a film that might make you appreciate how much worse things were for the generations born uh, in George Bailey's time, who had experienced a pandemic, the Great Depression, and at least one world war. That sense of compounded and snowballed trauma should make us grateful at least that we are not dealing with the many layers of trauma that that generation had to deal with. It's a Wonderful Life is an amazing film and does feel actually therapeutic. If you are ready to release some pent-up emotions after this year, then let James Stewart and Frank Capra take you gently by the hand and embrace this film's painful, cathartic and ultimately uplifting narrative about coming through grief and trauma and finding a way to reset your mind and your heart. Thank you so much for watching today and I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I'll see you next time. Bye.